welcome. Oh, go live. Hello, welcome to Happy Maths Hour. And today we we're going to, we're talking about Pi Day. It's and um, we're not talking about Pi Day. We're going to play with Pi, and we have the amazing Tony Bearden, who's supposed to be joining us. But I'm going to just oh, I think she's just come in. I think she's just here. We go. Right, Tony's with us. And so we're going to be playing with pie, but not just pie. We're going to be playing with all aspects of, we're going to be learning about the importance of play. After the break, we will be right back so that you can learn from Tony and her wisdom about the importance of play in learning. Welcome to, uh, to Happy Maths Hour. I introduced my set mine is Happy Maths Hour and the other way around. Welcome to Happy Maths Hour with Tony Beard and, and Caroline Ainsley. And it's all about helping you help your young learners to become better learners, to for you to become a better facilitator and the importance of maths and how giving you some great ideas and get great guidance on how you can help your young learners learn maths. And today it's all it's about play. Yesterday was Pi Day, March the 14th. And we've got a little bit of pie, a little bit of play, pie play with a pie plate. And the rest is all about, we're gonna, we are actually going to play, but we're gonna, we're gonna do a lot of talking about it. We're gonna, if you listen, you will find out. This is a great one for people driving, if they're listening on the radio driving because we're going to talk about the importance of play and how to deliver it. Tony. Have you, are you able to see the slides now, Caroline? Oh yes, got it, add to stream, there we go. Thank Good. you. Oh, there we are. You can see them. We can see them. At the moment we've got, right. that's it, beautiful. Okay, well, um, I know that Finland ranks very highly in international comparisons of student achievement in mathematics. They're one of the top countries in the world, and they have been consistently for, oh, 20, 30 years. But it's very interesting because they believe in learning through play. And they really incorporate that in their school the planning of their school day and children don't start school until they're seven in Finland, which is quite late um, in comparison to other European countries anyway. They have shorter school days than most other countries and teachers and local authorities have far greater autonomy in Finland than in many high performing countries the other high performing countries and despite all that all these play feature and the fact that play features powerfully in Finnish education they are really high achievers so uh, what do you think of this uh, diagram here Caroline? I got very excited when I saw that diagram because these are all the things that well actually this adds this diagram adds to my font of my toolkit in, in making maths fun, making maths um, intriguing and interesting and getting the, the learners to think for themselves. But it's got one of what the first word I saw was grit. And that I haven't used the word grit, but it is it's perseverance, determination. I do use that perseverance, determination. And this really does add to my toolkit magnificently. The sense of beauty, well, that's something we, I, I haven't called it the sense of beauty. We call it um, 
it's it, the, the, yeah with the, the beauty of maths is I've called it but that it's so clearly carefully thought out and ability to create questions how powerful is that it's something we expect teachers to do but we don't normally expect our learners to create their own questions. Well, we kind of do, don't we? But we ask them to do it in doing it the way AIMSEC does it, but mass. We do want them to create their own questions but to really be Caroline, part of the requirement. Yes. Mm. But when you think about what is learning all about these days, I mean, the children today will be the adults of tomorrow in a world that we can't even properly imagine now um, the whole world is changing so fast and what we can be certain of is that uh, being able to um, remember facts and being able to follow routine procedures will only give you a very low paid job in the world of the future because machines can do that so much better than people and what we want to be educating our children to achieve is these higher order skills. And what this is built, this um, diagram is built around, it's described as building blocks of playful learning. And it's learning those skills that, that the children are going to need in life. If they're teenagers now, it's going to come up sooner, but if they're small children in primary school, they may have 10 or more years to, to go before they're out there in the big wide world. But for all of them, these life skills are hugely important. Now, Caroline was talking about the ability to create questions. Well, what we want um, people in the uh, important jobs and in their homes too to be doing in the future is problem solving. The routine things will be done by computers. Human beings need to be creative and they need to be able to ask questions about what do we need and how are we going to achieve that? What's important in this um, process that I'm doing in my work or a doctor trying to cure a patient or whatever it is? And we've got to ask questions in our own heads or uh, in conversation and then try and solve, answer those questions. And we have to do investigation, finding out the, the facts and, uh, and what needs to be done to solve the problem. And then often using uh, automated machinery for measuring things and for building and all sorts <laughs> structuring. Um, so, so there are other things here, like, you know, it's courage. You've got to believe in yourself and you've got to be able to have good social reaction, uh, re interaction and relation with other people in, in the working world and in the family and in the home too. You've got to have creativity and originality and flexibility. Anything else strikes you, uh, strike you about this, Caroline? Yeah, courage for me is, is a huge one. Um, the other, um, what, one of the things that struck me was just just the whole, the mindset, but in the center, is the very thing in the center. I mean, the whole, the whole structure is based around empowering the learners, just every single aspect of it. And it's, that's how it has to be. To become a lifelong learner, you have to be empowered. You have to be, learn to think. But the middle, building blocks of playful learning. Every single one of those ovals is full of what's visualized as playful learning. And they're just um, guide, guidelines to playful learning. And what I like, one of them I like particularly is this idea of knowledge co-creation. <laughs> the idea that with colleagues, you actually have to discover and create the knowledge use the knowledge that's already known of course but it, if it, it you know if the problem's already been solved okay, okay fine but then you then you move on but it supposing you're you've got a difficult problem that there isn't a solution known to it then you have to create new knowledge not by yourself but working with other people i think that's uh, that's uh, 
very sort of tough challenge, isn't it? And then there's the it agents. Is, it, yes. It, isn't it a great destination? Isn't it a great per, some, what, be, to be searching for that, to actually put that in as your purpose for what your, the learners in school are going to come out with at the end? Isn't it? I, I'm blown away by it. I love reading about the Finnish school system, and I don't understand why we're all not doing it. <laughs> and then the next one around the uh, sort of just going anti-clockwise around that clock is agency and autonomy. You give people some responsibility for the next steps they're going to take. You make them the a change agents. So you give them agency and autonomy. Now, in the classroom, whether they're young children in primary school or teenagers, they should have some autonomy about their learning so that they learn how to behave like that as an adult. And working group work is important too in school so that they can do knowledge co-creation with other people. Of course, uh, Caroline and I are passionate about mathematics, aren't we, Caroline? Yes. And we believe that there is beauty in it. Um, and so, uh, and it's not just maths, other subjects too. You can be passionate. I've got, a, I've, I've got a wonderful story about beauty in mathematics. Well, this is specifically mathematics. I was, um, I was doing a week of bubbly maths in schools that a lady had arranged. She wasn't a teacher. She just really passionate about it and she she was a, she arranged various different people to come and and, and experience uh, deliver at schools in her in her village and her small town and she said she hates math she's no good at maths and and I'm like I'm sure that's not true and then we go I stayed with her in her, in her home she was a lovely woman and walked in and I Every, I don't know if every single, it felt as though every single picture on the wall, and there were lots of them, were all patterns and shapes. They were all highly, overtly, obviously mathematical. And I'm like, wait a minute, you said you don't like math. She goes, that's not math, that's art. What she could see was the beauty. And, and, it's, and she, was, she was a lover of the beauty of math. <laughs> Yes, I mean, a lot of maths is looking, is looking at patterns. So why does play matter? It's because our understanding of learning has changed. Certainly changed in the last 50 years a lot since I started teaching. And research has shown that there are clear relationships between academic achievement on the one hand and the experience of play and the development of social and self-regulatory skills on the other hand. Really important. And play helps people to build the skills needed in life. It's hard to predict career paths for young people now, all the social demands that they will face. So they'll need to adapt to change. They'll need to take new roles to continue lifelong learning, and then to understand the factual basis and technical processes and new jobs, but also at home. And people will need to engage in creative problem solving, that's what we were talking about, and to exercise resilience and flexibility in new conditions. Yes, because we're all, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm an old woman, but the children we're talking about, the young people, will be facing new conditions and changing conditions. Well, I think it's time for a break. And after the first play break, we'll, we'll have some play with pie and more about play power. I've got my plate ready to play with pie. See you after the break. Ooh, press the right button here.
Welcome back, to, welcome back to Happy Maths Hour with Tony and Caroline. Today it's all about playing with pi, and we're about to actually play with pi. Um, before we just talk about this, I can see what you're going to say. Um, is it all right to you stop sharing when we're ready, and, and I'll share my visualizer? Is that all right? Are you good with that, Tony? Okay, yes, yes. Or would um, you just have had it in my again. small little picture? Okay, you're good with that. Right, go ahead. I'm Thank not you. sure you need to, but Caroline, let's just get started. Um, okay. Now, I've shown you this picture of um, how um, AIMSEC, which is the organization I run, um, helps uh, teachers and parents at home to develop cost-free manipulatives. So what do the children play with? What do they play with at home? And what do they play with in school? Now, a lot of children have had um, packets from the kitchen and made their, up their own shop and made or been given some play money so that they can play shop with containers from the kitchen. Um, if the game needs counters, they can use beans or stones for counters. What you see here is models. You see in the middle of the picture there, people making models from rolled up paper sticks. Down on the left, you see a packet from the kitchen. And that's to learn about that particular shape, which is a cuboid, but you, in, in a maths lesson. But as I explained, toys don't have to be expensive things you buy. They can be items that you would throw away otherwise, containers, perhaps um, plastic containers that you would throw away that can be used for water play, all sorts of objects that um, are, are found around and don't cost very much. Now you see in the picture there the answer to what is the number pi and explain it. So here you see this picture now, Caroline, I'm going to stop sharing, and Caroline is going to do this. But well, do you want me to have a go? Do you want me to have a go with just my little camera and see how it looks while you're talking? I'll yes, do that. yes, if I'm you going think to it's stop. Okay. No, well, don't I'm stop sharing. Stop. See if this. See I'm if just going to work. Oh, if the, oh, I see. If I don't need to stop, okay. Right. I can't see you, Caroline, for some reason. No, you um, can't see me. You, you're seeing the place. But you just tell me. me if you want me to stop sharing. Okay, you, I can't see the screen at all, so you have to tell me if it's... Right, so I think Anna's got to play a, a plate, plate and some string. The first thing she's going to do is to wrap the string around the plate and cut it off so that the length of the string is exactly uh, the length of the distance wrap we call circumference. Tell me when you've done that, Caroline. Let me see. I'm going to start it there. I, I, I actually didn't think about that. I should have got some tape. So anyway, I'll go around like this and I'll hold it. And I'll hold Then cut it. the string so that you have a piece of string, which is the length of the circumference. And then stretch it out into a line. Okay, it's more or less there. This isn't. This isn't precise. It doesn't have to be exact. Do as well as do it as well as you can. It's definitely not exact. Okay. Yeah. Right. So now then, take this, your string. Uh, no, take your string again. Yeah. No, I and have to stretch. Meditate. Stretch it across through the middle of the plate, and just mark where you think the middle is, and just mark the distance across the widest part, which is the. So, um, the diameter and cut a piece, the piece of string and do, do that three times so that you've got three diameters. Don't cut them too long, just make them exactly the, the diameter distance across. I'm going to mark them, I'm actually going to fold them in half so I get the center correct. You, do, you don't need to do that. You don't need the centre oh. particularly. You can oh, do. You, you it's said, perfectly you said, fine. centre, so I was just doing it. So I didn't think it, it, it doesn't. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. You're getting them the right length is, is the most important thing. Right. I've got three diameters and one circumference. And just put the, put the strings that are the diameters underneath 
the long string, which is the circumference, and what what do what do you notice? I've got one to there, and then I'm going to continue this one there, and keep going, and then get the plate, move the plate out of the way so that you can see better. And then I'm going to add the third one where that last one left off. And oh my goodness, they're almost the same length. But just a bit less. So there's, 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 just a bit less. Hmm. So the, what, we, what we've learned is that the number pi, <clears throat> which, well, I'm, it will, this is how pi is defined. It's a ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle. And it's just a bit more than three. The circumference is just a bit more than three diameters. And um, your, 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 your learners, your children, your students should do that themselves, or at least in pairs, um, just what you've seen Caroline do. No, I've, I've, I'd just like to say that I did not do anything like this when I was in school, and I only learned this exercise when I was about forty-five years old, and it completely blew my mind. And, and pi just—I understood pi after that. It was like well, it was just a number. It was a bit finicky because you had to remember it. But knowing where it's derived from, not just being told where it's derived from, knowing it because I'd done it myself it was beautiful. Well, well, there's a lot of interesting, there's a lot of interesting facts about pi. I put a few here on the, on the screen. Can you see this one? This this um, chart, Caroline. Y yes, it's it's a little bit. Um, well, I'm going to read it because read. it's quite small. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, pi is the number pi is just a bit more than three. It's three point one four one something something something, and on it goes, and so. March, which is the third month, the 14th at well, March the 14th, which was yesterday, is we'll call Pi Day, or it was also called the International Day of Mathematics because of this number Pi. It also was Einstein's, Albert Einstein's birthday, coincidentally. Exactly. Now, you might, <laughs> you might ask. You know, if, if if pi is 3.14159 something, 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 how long, you know, how long is it? How many digits does it have? And the answer is that it's infinite. It never ends. So it's an infinite decimal. Um, pi is an irrational number, irrational number. It cannot be written as a fraction. No way. Now, I think some of you are thinking, oh, but pi is 22 over 7. Sorry, folks, it is not. Absolutely not. It's an, 22 over 7 is an approximation to pi. It's pretty close to pi, but it isn't pi. And I think a lot of people will have learned that pi was 22 over 7 in school. So they learned something that was false okay no, something now, else yeah and this is something i didn't never understood was why a number was called rational or irrational and I'd, I'd heard them but i never learned them because i didn't understand them it was a perfectly good explanation mm. a, a rational number is a number that you can be expressed as a fraction with two whole numbers Whereas yeah. an irrational fraction can never be expressed, at, which is pi, even though you, you might have been seen, seen as 22 over 7, it's not. Because it cannot be written as a fraction or a ratio of two whole numbers. Therefore, it is irrational. irrational yes, but that, that's a bit confusing, a Caroline. It is? What saying, well, I thought what, it just cleared it up for me, and now I'm saying it's No, confusing. no, no. It's just, no, no. What, what, what might be confusing is that I said pi was a ratio of the circumference to the diameter. But oh, when yeah, you work out, when you numbers, work, yes, exactly. But when you work that out, it is, it, it's not the ratio of two whole numbers, as Caroline so 
so rightly said. <laughs> it's two um, whole so, numbers. That's why it's important. It has to be whole numbers. For it to be a rational number, it has to be whole numbers. It has to be the ratio, ratio, re rational. And if that helps you remember what an irrational and a rational number is, then I hope that helps. So it, what we know about pi is that it's an infinite decimal expansion. There are no patterns, so it's very difficult to memorize. And so people try to compete about remembering how many digits. Bit of a crazy, crazy uh, thing people. to try. Crazy people. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And um, pi comes from the Greek letter P, um, which uh, stood for perimeter because it's the it's the ratio of the distance around to the diameter. It's the six, which is the sixteenth number in the Greek alphabet, um, and it's been known human beings have known about pi and have known that it's an irrational number and then known that it's a little bit more than three for almost four thousand years might not have used the language we use today but they knew about pi um and it oh, was no. first no, studied by out, the, yeah archimedes of Syracuse, and this is a, a good story, but it's it's supposed to be true, but he was so engrossed in his mathematical work that he didn't notice that Rome had been conquered by, uh, that the Romans had conquered Syracuse. And a Roman soldier came up to him and yelled at him in Greek, uh, and he yelled at the, um, the soldier in Greek, don't touch my circles. Well, it probably wasn't circles. He was probably like my husband, engrossed in some mathematics, and he didn't want to be disturbed. And the Roman soldier simply cut off his head and went on about what he was doing. Um, so we want to talk about free play, and we want to talk about play that is led by other children, other young people. We want to talk about rule-based activities as opposed to free play, but they're both important. They both have their place, and we should have time for each of them. And investigations that lead to problem solving. Now, you see some nice pictures here of, well, the top one there is free play, little children playing with water in the three tubs there. One of the little girls has got into the tub, you see they've got some containers that they can pour water from. It's free, uh, free play with water and other free play is really, really important. There's a lot about measurement uh, that is you learn from uh, that sort of activity, measurement of capacity, volume and capacity. And <laughs> play lays the foundation for literacy and numeracy. Through play, children learn to make and practice new sounds. Play helps with, with vocabulary development. Children try out their talk on their friends and exercise their imagination through storytelling. You also see those boys who are obviously cooking something and that is rule-based play. I mean, I'm sure they're thrilled to produce biscuits or make an omelet that they can eat or something. I don't know what they're making in that picture. Um, play nurtures development. It fulfills a baby's inborn need to learn. And we don't want them to ever lose that need to learn and curiosity. It ta play takes many forms. They might shake a rattle or play peekaboo and hide and seek. It can be done by a young person alone or with another young person in a group or with an adult. It can be done by young children, um, preschool, and by teenagers. Different play, but just as importantly, it's play. And it Indeed, encourages... The finished, uh, the, sorry. Finished chart, the finished chart that we had at the beginning, that was one of the things that they mentioned. It's one of the things that, that I've, I've always known, is that one of the keys to really great teaching is to make sure that the child maintains their love of play, maintains learning through play. Maintain, that, that helps them maintain their fascination for learning and ensures that they are lifelong learners. And it's this, and that is the key to make sure that that stays alive rather than suppressing it, which, is, which unfortunately happens in, in, 
in school as we know it, as opposed to future school, which hopefully will be the way of the future. Yes, and just before we, we have a break, I just wanted to add the last thing there, that it encourages teachers and parents to communicate with the children in their lives. And adults need to support play by giving children opportunities to play, and they need to know when to intervene and when not to intervene. Now, these 10 reasons why play is important, I got from the National Literacy Trust, but they apply equally well to mathematics. And so after the second break, we're going to carry on talking about some of more of these 10 reasons why play is important for learning. See you after the break. Welcome back to Happy Maths Hour. Today we're learning about the power of play. Well, here we've got four more reasons for why play is important, why it's important to serious learning. It's, it should be enjoyable, but it's serious learning. We are talking about high achievement in mathematics, higher achievement because <laughs> there's more to learn these days than there used to be because knowledge is increasing at a, a really fast pace. So despite there being more to learn, we're still saying it's important to give children time and space to learn, to play. So it gives young people the chance to be spontaneous. So <laughs> you may think your child should be rolling the truck on the ground or should be doing a calculation in the way you do it. But that doesn't mean that the truck is not equally useful as a stacking toy or the calculation won't work out in the child's own way. Let them, let them have some freedom to invent their own methods and what they, what they do. And of course, there is a place for guidance but that should never be constraining. What do you think, Caroline? Well, I, I love the, the balance um, games where you, you literally buy something with arches where you can balance, but I know my grandson likes to balance anything. And they, there's a challenge on how high he can make it. Well, it, that is a great developmental game and absolutely uses trucks and, and and the, the more difficult it is balance, the more interested he is in doing it. So uh, that's, that also develops the, 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 the mindset of wanting to have a challenge and wanting to be able to overcome the challenge or to, to complete the challenge, which is a really great um, state of mind to be learning in. The play also gives children choice. Having sufficient access to play outdoors in open spaces and near trees and having objects to play with or activities to choose from, that'll allow children to express themselves. And different children will do that in different ways. Um, <laughs> I, I saw a little girl playing just outside here. In the, I live in a flat, so we've got communal gardens. And she was talking away to her teddy bear and uh, mother wasn't in sight, but I'm sure her mother was looking out the, the window because the flats look out on this open space here or in the doorway somewhere. And, and she sat the, uh, her little teddy bear on the branch of the tree and she was still talking to him. And then she, she moved the branch and he fell off. It was all part of the play. I don't know what that was about. 
<laughs> play gives children space to practice well, physical it, movement. And it's not not just that with the choice as well. It's and the, the, this one includes the space. And that is that if they're afraid of something, it gives them the opportunity to slowly but surely overcome that fear rather than being persuaded to do something, just being given the space, okay, this, that's the objective and you can just take your time about it or not even make it the objective. You know it's the objective, but don't necessarily share that with them. And when they see other children do it or you do it, then they'll give them a desire to do it. And it just literally gives them the choice and the space to, to, to grow. Hmm. So it play gives them space to practice physical movement and balance and to test their own limits. And of course, the, we're talk, now we're thinking about free play, but also games, organized games like, uh, well, football could be just kicking a ball around and, you know, no, no, no real or rules particularly to the game or it can be a proper game of football with two teams and you know played according to the rules and of course there are many many different uh, physical activities from you know swimming and uh, and <coughs> other games many other games and sports and um, playing on a trampoline or whatever it is um, where they're learning quite a lot about the world around them as well and also about interacting all those social skills and also um you know how to how to be involved in something and do your part as one of a team and play gives parents and teachers the chance to learn how to play a game themselves and one of the most challenging parts of play is how you incorporate yourself in it as a member of the group and uh, not, in fact, um, you know, taking over spoiling it for anybody else. Um, now, here we're now up to number eight in our list of ten, and here we've got four more important things. So, play allows parents and teachers to learn their child's body language. Knowing when you should incorporate yourself in children's play is key. I'll, I think I put it down as number 10, but I'm going to mention it now. Children might get upset because they feel that they won't get involved because they don't like to lose. And they are, <laughs> then they're an even bigger loser if they don't participate because they're afraid to lose. But if you see that in their demeanor, then as an adult, you can give them the right amount of encouragement. So they do take part and, uh, and the right experience so that they know that they're going to win sometimes perhaps, but maybe it's by losing a few times that they learn to be better at the whatever it is and um eventually to be able to win now this targets a thousand chess, games. chess players will tell you good chess players will tell you the best way to learn chess is by losing like a thousand matches of chess just always play against someone who's better than you and a, yes. a, a good chess player doesn't have that need to win they have the need to get better that's, that's a really good example. I mean, one thing that, uh, one way of teaching children to play chess, which is often used, is for them to play um, the, the, the teacher just to have one or two pieces to start with and to play over and over again until the child can actually beat the teacher. But of course, the, the child has got all the pieces and the teacher's just got one or two peach, pieces. And then the teacher brings in a third piece. And at first, if there are three pieces and there's a good chess player, the teacher's a good chess player, the, the, ch the child will, as Caroline says, lose again a few times before they learn that actually with all your pieces, you can certainly build, beat an opponent with three pieces. And so it goes on. So you're giving the child, you as a teacher are not playing badly you're playing well, but you've only, and you're showing them how to play well, but you've only got a limited number of pieces, even from the start. And so the child doesn't keep losing 
all they keep they keep getting to a point where they can now win and then you make you step up the challenge and and so they go on to learn more so play teaches parents and teachers emotional intelligence patience and understanding because you need that as a teacher and as a parent you need all those things and so do the children um, and if you do choose to join in the child's play you should make sure that you don't try to take it over and force incorporation of your objectives into their play although as a teacher that has to be that has to be how it happens eventually that shouldn't upset the children they should be wanting to learn and wanting you to at times give them you know a bit of a lead as to what they should do next by asking them to think about the next steps and structured adult led activities have their time and place and they are important but we must learn to allow time for children to control it and to decide they're on their own play because they too need to develop the emotional intelligence of how to interact with others in a group and patience about you know i'm not getting this right i've got to keep trying and, and the um, perseverance and the understanding now this target a thousand game it's a very simple game so we can see from the little picture there more or less what happens you have a spinner and you keep spinning the uh, and randomly different numbers come up different digits come up from naught one two three up to nine and you put them in uh, everybody has a copy of that little, um, <clears throat> what you see there three three digit numbers uh, added up to see the total and if they're all around 300 and something the total will be near a thousand but the what they're trying to achieve is to get the total as near as a thousand as possible but they only write the numbers in one by one and they come up randomly so once the number's been written it can't be changed and if the whole class is doing this each each um students doing it for themselves there's a lot of building of numeracy and number sense in this and the one who gets closest to a, a thousand wins there are various little rules about that that if you go to <clears throat> the aiming high website and uh, look at the targets a thousand game or if you look at the face aimsec facebook page it's it's on there today play is fun learning to play to play well sorry oh. i was i was getting it ready and, and pressed it by mistake sorry well i was going to say the last thing here and then we'll have the break is that play is fun learning to play to play well both by themselves and with others it sets children up to be contented and sociable and play is how young people learn how to be a good loser we said that and that's important too and to enjoy play whether they win or they lose and know that and sometimes they're going to win so and learn my, my, my me and my grandson's catchphrase perseverance and determination <laughs> so we're going to learn something about computer programming through play after the break and after the break i'm going to become a robot See you after the break. Time for a show on Relax Radio. It talks about me and you. It's time for a show on Relax Radio. It talks about me and you. So listen to us here 24 hours and let the happiness come to you. So, Caroline, so, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the this slide together and discuss it, and then I'm going to stop sharing, and you'll need to have your camera on you because you're going to be the robot. <laughs> and, yes, um, I am. Yes, and we're going to show you how um, 
you and uh, your uh, the children you teach, if you're not already an, an expert computer programming or coder, can learn how to write computer code. And you don't, uh, and it doesn't matter whether the children you're working with are five or 18 or whether we're talking about adults. This is a good way to learn uh, basic principles of computer coding. Now, it's using Logo software and it's free and you can download it from the internet. Um, just Google um, FMS Logo for Microsoft Windows or ACS Logo for Mac, uh, Mac OS just logo and you can download it for free onto your computer. And then if you go to the Aiming High website, the two links are there. You can start our series of challenges. You don't need to know anything about how to write computer code. You don't need to get anything at all. And you'll soon be drawing many different geometrical patterns and learning some geometry. You'll learn the basics of computer coding and then if you persevere, you'll learn how to do some algebra using Logo as well. So it isn't just what they call turtle graphics. The, so, those, links, those links for Command the Robot on the Aiming High website, they're in the description. Just So you, yes. you can just go down there and click on them. Now, you see a picture of a turtle there because this original logo was created at Massachusetts Inter in, in, Institute of Technology as a um, as a, a software for children learning in school, and um, it uses a robot that's a little turtle, which can be on your screen, or it can be like the Roma there. You see a little robot with a pad on his back and buttons that tell you whether to turn right, left, or go forward, and how many steps, you can fill in the number of how many steps he's got to go forward. Um, and the turtle that you saw there, and the rectangle, um, it, he, if you do it him on the ground on a piece of paper, he has a pen under his tummy. And as he goes forward, if the pen is down, it draws a line. Of course, you can make you can make the pen up so he can get from place to place without drawing lines that you may not want in your diagram. So he he will follow your directions, which are very simple, and he will go forward. He'll make he'll turn through the angle you tell him to. Uh, he can go backwards, um, and so with a very very few commands. You can be drawing simply quite so quite pretty and complicated patterns like the one you see on the left, and Caroline's going to do that. Um, <laughs> so if I get the instructions right, so what the what you can do with your class is um, or your group of children is actually to uh, take them outside where there's plenty of space. And at first, the adult can be the person who gives the instructions and the children can be the robots. But once they get the idea, they can, one of them can take over and they can be the leader and they can be, you know, tell the whole of the rest of the group, including the adults in the group, what to do, how far and, to go and, forward. And, and design, yeah, and design their own instructions rather than repeat the ones the, the first demonstration, everybody designs their own shape and then see if they can get somebody else to follow that shape. Yes, and if you pursue the sequence of, of, um, of these uh, ideas, following on Command the Robot 1, Command the Robot 2, and then there are more ideas beyond that, then um, there's some suggestions, but of course you can you can create, you can decide on what you want to do and create your own patterns. Now, just before I stop sharing, I, I, want to, I couldn't resist sharing this link with you. Um, it, here, this, this um, father, this dad, with his children, he says he'll make them a peanut butter sa a jelly sandwich if they give him precise, clear directions. You see, if you're going to give a computer 
or a robot directions. If you're going to program a computer, write code, then it has to be clear, unambiguous, and no chance to go wrong. Okay? Otherwise, the computer can't do it. It doesn't know what you mean. It doesn't can't read your mind. It can't guess. It, it um, so <laughs> it, this is an absolutely hilarious video because the children think they're giving good instructions and the father does exactly what they, they have told him and it all goes wrong time and time again because their instructions are not precise. <laughs> So that's it's, that's a it's actually known as the PB and J challenge. Just Google it, go on YouTube, look for it. You'll find that one with that image. It's it, Tony's put the link there, but that's not a clickable link. I haven't put it in the description. It's, yes, it's it's absolutely brilliant, and it's a great thing for you to attempt at home as well. Well, all these happy mass are. Um, programs are going to be on YouTube and then they will have all the, all the links you could possibly need with them when they're on YouTube and uh, Caroline's working on that. So I'm stopping sharing yeah, Caroline. I'm, I'm out, Tony, just not on the Maths Toys channel. That's an improved version on the Maths Toys channel. Right. Yes, okay. that's on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now, Caroline, when you're ready. Well, um, tell me. I'm here. I'm at the disposal. Um, uh, can you can you get a bit further away from the computer so we can see your feet, or maybe um, not? No. From the from. Oh, okay, we can't. We can only see you from the knees down. Uh, it, it, it's it's just that it would have been nice to see you. How many steps uh, from your legs? We can see oh, how many steps. My arms. We can see how many steps. Well, it, yes. All right. No, you're behind me, Tony. So I've. I've, I've um. I've, Yes, I, I, yes, of course, if you do this, uh, if you do this out of doors, it's much better because you can see, you know, you've got plenty of room and you can see uh, other space available. So, um, so, so how many paces, Caroline, is it roughly from where you're standing up to the, ne the obstruction in front of you? Four? In front of me is the, the, is the computer. Is yes, I know, but are you going to be able to take four steps forward? I'm going to take, I'm going to take yeah, can I take four steps forward. Little I'll, steps then. Okay. Steps. All right. I'm forward. Can you take, Caroline, can you take four steps? Can you turn right, Caroline? Wait a no, minute. turn left okay. because it doesn't seem to be much space on the right. Here we go. Turn my back to you. Now what? What, no, I want you to turn a quarter turn. Yeah, I've got my back to you so we know which is left and right. Quarter turn right. It doesn't, yes, okay. Quarter turn right. Caroline, I just want to know how much space you've got there. You can take four steps in that direction, can you? Yes. Four small steps, yes. Okay. So uh, I think you need to get as far back into that corner as you can so that you've got a maximum amount of space. All right. Now, um, OK, Caroline, I think you need to face the uh, you, you can face the front so people can see you. Fa OK. Now, Caroline, go forward, forward two. One, two. Okay, Caroline, left turn one. So left turn one quarter, one quarter. That's right. Forward four. One, two, three, four. Left turn a quarter turn. Forward two. One, two. Forward a quarter turn, uh, sorry, a quarter, left a quarter turn. Forward four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> um, left another quarter turn. What shape, what shape did you go around? I did a rectangle that was two by four. And you've ended up 
facing the direction you were when you started. And my directions weren't terribly clear, so well done, Caroline. <laughs> I just refused to move. Computer said no if it, if it was confused. <laughs> so it forced you to give me clear instructions. Okay, now it would be much easier if we, we had more space, but we're, we're doing well. Okay, let's, let's have a go at this, Caroline. So, right. um, okay, so what I want you to do is forward four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so left quarter turn, forward four. One, two, Three, four. Left quarter turn. Forward four. One, two, three, four. Left quarter turn. Forward four. One, two, three, four. Left quarter turn. Now you've gone round a square, yes? Four by four square. Yes, okay. Um, right. Now, <laughs> let's see if you can do a bit of a zigzag. Okay, Caroline. Um, okay. So, okay. So, what I, what I want you to do is to um, go forward one. One. Forward one, right? Another one. Uh, yes. Um, le left a quarter, left a quarter, a forward one, yes, left forward one, left a quarter turn, forward two, one, two, right a quarter turn, forward two, one, two, left a quarter turn, forward two. One, two. <laughs> right a quarter turn. Forward one. Right one. a quarter turn. Forward one. One. Right a quarter turn. Forward two. One, two. Left a quarter turn. Forward two. One, two. Right a quarter turn. Forward one. One. Left a quarter turn. Forward one. One. Left a quarter turn. Okay, I'm doing that. Now, Caroline, you have just done the square. I don't know whether the people watching you were able to see it, but you did extremely well, really well. And you did a square with the zigzag pattern inside it that was on the screen, on my screen. Oh, oh, we can't see that. We can't see your screen. Well, I know, but they saw it before. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, okay, so you, okay, so you managed to give me the instructions and I managed to follow them. That duplicated the pattern you had on your screen. Yes. So we haven't got much much time now. About a minute. So, if if you had done, if we'd done this with a group of children, I mean, you know, they could they could see the pic. They they might do it by seeing the picture, and then um, giving the instructions so that the uh, the the children who are acting as the robots trace out the picture or they might do that on their computer and they will watch it being drawn as as they type the instructions into their computer if they do it on their computer and it goes wrong it doesn't matter because they can quickly change it and they, by making mistakes they it's a beautiful system but by making mistakes, they learn from those mistakes by putting them right. And that's really the most important way that people learn to be good computer coders. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the other, the other thing to say, if you were a bit sharp just now, you'll have realized that Caroline repeat, we, we repeated the same instructions again and again and again. So the next instruction that they would learn would be the repeat instruction. So mm. instead of me telling Caroline the same thing again and again and again, I would tell her that they had to do this, but they had to do it four times, okay, yeah. or twice. And so yeah. it would cut down on the number of instructions by doing the repeat in there. Yeah. And then you you get packages that are little sort of collections of instructions that are called procedures, and uh, very simply after a you know a few um, lessons of experience of doing this, um, if they're teenagers, but if they're much younger, they're lunch enough to have play with a aroma like I showed you a little sort of toy thing, toy robot. Um, then they can build up to this gradually, but. It, you know if they if they only meet this but but when they're 14 for the first time or even 17 um they can anybody or even if they let meet it when they're 8 years old they can learn very quickly how to do sim write a simple computer code well i think we're out of time thank caroline you, yes we're a minute over so thank <laughs> you so much and go Play the robots. Command your robot. Follow the link, and we'll we'll put a live link in the other um, in the other one for for the um, for the PB and J challenge. It's a great challenge. See you next week, five o'clock London time for Happy Maths Hour on Monday. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Goodbye.